hit subscribe now so you can receive all the up-to-date videos. One of you is one of them and you're extremely important. So thank you. We don't have an organization unless we have you. And if we don't have a purpose, then we're not going anywhere. Well, we have a purpose, we have drive, and we have some guests tonight who are gonna help us all understand this a little bit better. And I just wanna say to each of you, if you'd like to know my story just a little bit more clear, just go to McFinn at medium.com and there's 16 chapters up there right now for you to check out. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Indu. Good evening, Indu. Thank you, McFinn. Um, today, it's my honor to introduce uh, Dr. James Berry. Uh, I think Dr. James Berry is no stranger to um, many of you here um, in the ALS community. I mean, one thing that's consistently we hear about um, uh, Dr. Berry is that, you know, his, um, you know, his appreciation for um, the ALS community and uh, his genuine care for the people. And that comes across um, to everybody we talk to. So it's a great honor to have um, James here. And James is a chief of division of ALS and MND at MGH. And he's also director of uh, MGH's uh, multiple disciplinary of, of ALS clinic. And also he's a director of NCRI and executive committee of NEALS. Um, and one thing that I've really appreciated working with uh, James is he's out of the box thinker. And, you know, today I would say, you know, a lot of our successful programs, he's the man behind the screen. So I would like to thank him personally for how he's helped us, you know, and, um, and really worked with us very closely to get some of our programs right. And, you know, we had pure energy and fire and, you know, he was kind of the, one of those guiding lights behind it. So thank you, James. And with that, I'll hand it over to you and, uh, uh, I'm honored to have you here today. Thank you very much. I'm incredibly honored to be here. The, the, the Everything ALS community is just remarkable and I am so thrilled to be here. I, I was just um, overjoyed to get the invitation. So thank you for having me. So, um, I, I, you know, what I'm gonna talk about today is digital biomarkers to hasten drug development for ALS, but also give us clinical insights to ALS. And I think what's, um, you know, really the, the questions that we can ask ourselves when we think about digital biomarkers is, you know, is there a way to do trials and get more data and have it be easier for people to participate and have the results be more meaningful or more reflective of people's lives? That's really where we're coming from when we're talking about digital biomarkers. And this is a field that's changed dramatically in medicine over the last, certainly over the last five years. And in ALS, we've been uh, really changing things over the last couple of years. To understand what we, what we want to do with digital biomarkers, let's talk for a moment about traditional ALS outcome measures, how we use them and what they are. When we say outcome measure, we're often, we're often thinking about trial situations um, where we're measuring something and we're saying how a disease is changing over time. And then we're you know, hopefully testing a therapeutic to say, does that therapeutic slow down the rate of change uh, in, in the disease? But we need to measure that somehow. One of the heavy lifters for this is the, is the revised ALS functional rating scale or ALS FRSR. It's a 12 item questionnaire. It's, it's scored zero to 48. Most people on the phone are probably familiar with it. Um, it's in four domains. Um, and, it, and it really, you know, it's a, a good scale in many regards. It, it gives us the expected results and does better than, than we have in many areas of neurology and medicine. But I think there are also ways that it could be improved. We also measure vital capacity, which is a measure of essentially how much air people can breathe in and out of their lungs at a time, uh, which can be affected by, by, by the strength of the muscles of the core of the body. And we can measure quantitative strength. We do that with um, devices like handheld dynamometry or, or the accurate test of limb isometric strength. These are tools that are basically like handheld scales that we can push against and say, how many pounds of pressure can somebody generate with a muscle? And the last thing we look at is, is survival. Now, these are all very relevant to ALS, um, and they're things that we want to change, but we think we can get even closer to, to sort of what we want to change and the effect we want to have. So digital biomarkers might reflect changes in function and, and in quality of life faster and more accurately than these standard outcome measures. And they might be more efficient, more statistically powerful, 
um, and, and easier to do than, than standard outcome measures. And they might facilitate more efficient clinical trials as well. And as I said in the beginning, they might have clinical utility. It's possible that we could have a digital biomarker that will stream data uh, to, a, to a patient and to a physician so that they can make decisions more quickly about what's going on. We see this in the, the airline industry all the time. There's real-time data coming out of the engine. Um, digital phenotyping is defined as quantifying individual level human phenotype, that is sort of a human, human behavior in situ, in during life, using data from personal digital de devices. And this is a definition from, from a colleague, J.P. O'Nella at the School of Public Health at Harvard. When we think about this, what we're saying is, can we understand, can we quantify people's behavior um, very easily during their life? And there are two ways we can do that. One is with active data collection, which is we ask participants to perform some tests at home, answer a survey, make a recording, um, and, and that can be very powerful. We can get real-time data at any time of day, well, maybe not any time of day, but at a broad time of, uh, throughout the day. Um, and um, the problem here is, is adherence. We have to think about how do we make it so that it's easier for people to do this than not do it. Um, people want to participate in these studies. They want to give this data, but how do we make it so that they can do that uh, reliably? And then there's something called passive data collection where people live their lives and we quantify behavior using sensors. So we get accelerometer data or we get GPS data. And the, it's, I'll show you some data that shows that people are more likely to continue to contribute this kind of data. The problem here is the thing we have to deal with is noise because we get a lot of data and we need to have algorithms to process that data. Just to give you a sense of what we mean by all of this, traditional outcome measures really provide a sparse data. So in a clinical trial, for example, we might measure ALS, FRSR and vital capacity once a month. Maybe it's once every other month, but let's say it's once a month over a six month trial. If somebody misses, misses one of their visits, you're, you see you're missing almost 20% of the data that they would contribute to that trial. So we think we can do better with using active digital monitoring. Maybe we could ask a questionnaire once a week. That wouldn't be you know, outrageously intrusive. And we might even be able to ask a questionnaire every day, maybe not a whole 12 item questionnaire, but maybe a couple of questions. But we certainly should be able to passively monitor, sort of check in on a sensor once a day. When we really get to big data sets is when we really start talking about passive monitoring that can be continuous or nearly continuous um, going on all the time. And that gives us a huge amount of data. But I told you that you know, algorithms are important here. And just to give you a sense, passive data is hugely voluminous. Here we show some GPS data and it would be very difficult to draw any conclusions from this. It's hard to even tell if we're really talking about one person or more than one person's data or what's going on. But if I told you this was distance traveled from a number of people, you still wouldn't be able to make much sense of it. Once we apply an algorithm to that, then we do get data that we can make sense of. And you can see that all these people are traveling different, different dis distances per day and that that's changing over time. For most people, it's declining. And that is sort of um, shows you the power of, of getting a lot of data over time. Now, in addition to being able to collect that data, we really need machine learning or, or AI to be able to process it. And, and luckily, this is a field that's advancing. And just to give a couple of, this is not my field, but just to give a couple of kind of landmarks for how this is beginning to contribute to our lives. In 2013, IBM Watson, which is a big supercomputer, was used to help um, aid in management decisions in lung, lung cancer. And that's a program that had grown for some time. Then there's a behind the scenes tool called TensorFlow that Google made open source for machine learning, really allowing more machine learning to be crowdsourced so that, so that more problems could be solved. And that happened in 2015. In 2017, Apple integrated deep learning into, into Siri to improve uh, sort of the understanding of our speech. And there was really a leap forward. And this was the time when people began to use Siri rather than sort of it was a novelty item. And then just to show a couple of pictures of, of people that can give you a sense of how powerful um, really AI has become, um, let's see, these, uh, these three people that I just showed are kind of an example of that, but they're not actually people. These are portraits that are generated by a machine learning algorithm. You can find others like them at thispersondoesnotexist.com, which came onto the web in 2019. Um, the computer learns what a portrait looks like and then can essentially draw pictures of people who don't exist. 
Um, so we're getting really, really powerful with this. And so collecting a lot of data rather than be being a problem as it was in the past is really becoming an opportunity. And smartphones present another opportunity because packed into that smartphone that we carry around and generally use to text and call and maybe search the web every now and again are huge numbers of really high quality sensors, an accelerometer and a gyroscope, a global position sensor, um, call logs and text logs are kept. Um, not, not what's said, but just rather did someone receive a call today or how many. Um, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Um, and then even just looking at screen on and off presents an opportunity. People's screen goes off when they're sleeping. The phone isn't moving when they're sleeping, just to give you an example. We can also gather active data from smartphones, fine finger movement tasks, cognition tasks, and making speech recordings with really studio quality microphones that are included in our smartphones. And there's also, there are combinations of this passive and active data so that we might have people do something that they do kind of habitually throughout their day, um, but it's a constrained activity. Typing is an example of that. And I'll talk about a study where we're, where we're looking at that. And not only do these, there are smartphones packed with opportunities, but actually, 66% of people suffer from what we call nomophobia, which is a real fear of running out of battery, not having service or losing their cell phone. And it's estimated that 91% of adults have their mobile phone within arm's reach throughout the day, all day. That's less than two feet away. So, you know, this, where the phone goes, that's where the person goes as well. Um, so there are real opportunities. Smartphone apps and web-based tools are you know, really software that gives them a very flexible design. We can collect passive and active data. It is important to say that we can easily, in our zest for this, overload people with tasks, and we have to be cautious about that. And the other thing is that smartphones can't truly collect continuous data. We would wear down the battery very quickly. And believe me from experience in the early days of this, that makes people very upset. Um, so we're cautious about that. Another way to go is look at wearable devices, which are purpose-built and truly give us continuous data. But the challenge is that managing multiple devices can be overwhelming. Even simple things like charging and uploading data or downloading a new, uh, a, a new software to go on the wearable device or connecting it to a phone, et cetera, those things can become, very quickly become bothersome and usage can drop off over time if we really ask people to wear something that's cumbersome. None of those things mean that they're, they're not useful it just mean, means we have to be thoughtful about the tools. So I think researchers, people with ALS and regulators would really like to move to digital outcome measures. The goal is to do these trials that I've talked about faster, less burden, more reflective of real life impact. But there are some things we have to understand first. To be worth adopting, we have to improve on our current outcomes. So we could come up with a digital outcome measure, but if it doesn't tell us about the disease like ALS FRSR does, if it doesn't give us new insights into the disease or um, change more rapidly, then it may not be worth all of the trouble that we go to to uh, to enact it. And we have to we have to we have to show that. So there are steps to adopting outcome measure, digital outcome measures. We have to gather data to show the the utility. We have to feel comfortable with the usability and we have to understand the change over time. And I think that sets the stage for some of the studies that we've been doing. Uh, and one of the studies that I'll talk about is the, the, the one that I've been doing the longest. Um, it's been going on for about four or five years, but started very small because there was a lot of skepticism really about, about the whole field back then on the part of researchers. It's called the Symptom Monitoring for ALS in Real Time or SMART study. And I take no credit for that catchy name. That was one of the research coordinators. Um, but we used something called the BWE platform, which was developed by J.P. Onella, um, who's at the, a researcher at the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, it's a secure, convenient, very flexible uh, software. It's open source, which means that it's reproducible. I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that later, but, um, but, but the study can be reproduced in the future as well. The data is encrypted on the phone. It's encrypted on the way to the server. It's stored in a HIPAA compliant environment on the, on the Amazon. Uh, web services web. And now I'm not showing it here, but there actually is even a web-based um, um, analysis tool that's built into this as well called Forest. Now, when we started, we were collecting in-person data um, because we needed to benchmark this cell phone data against something. And the best thing that we have is really the ALS FRSR and, and vital capacity. And then we got active app data, which was a survey at baseline that I'll talk about in a moment called Communi Communicative Participation Item Bank and a weekly survey of the ALS FRSR as well as a speech sample and a cough recording. And then passive app data from the sensors on the phone. 
Um, one of the first things that we looked at with a colleague, two colleagues, Jordan Green and Kate Conahan uh, at Mass General is motor speech analysis. And, and we had people read a standard passage called the bamboo passage. And we looked at a, a variable called average pause duration. And what that means is you have people read a passage, you record the entire time that they're not talking during that passage, including short breaks between words and between sentences. And then you divide that by the number of pauses that they take. And that gives you the average duration of a pause. And that average duration of a pause is usually on the order of you know, somewhere between a third and a half of a second. And what we found is that that average pause duration went up over six months in everybody except for one person that we measured. Interestingly, that person made all their recordings early on late at night. And later in the study, they made them all in the morning, which gives us more ideas about how we can actually um, uh, analyze speech over the day. We also got some insights into speech rate that we hadn't had before, which is that when we divided people into those who had a, a, um, slowed speech at baseline, sort of abnormalities of their speech at baseline, compared to people who had rapid normal speech at baseline, we found that the people who came into the study with an abnormality in their speech had progression of that abnormality. The people who came in with normal speech did not as reliably have that. In fact, in some cases, we can see that people were probably learning the passage and reading it faster over time. And that gives us a sense of how we might apply something like this in a clinical trial. It may be that we wanna focus on a subgroup within that trial for a certain outcome measure. In this case, we might say we're gonna analyze the, the speaking rate of people who have an abnormal speaking rate at baseline. That gives us more statistical power in a trial. So this is the kind of insight that we just, we just didn't have before these kinds of studies. I talked before about the communicative participation item bank, which forevermore I will call the CPIB because that is a, a big name. This is a 10 item questionnaire and it talks about communication, not about can people say words or how fast do they say them, but how are they conveying meaningful things to other people? And it is a questionnaire that is, has been shown to be tied to quality of life and is a meaningful questionnaire. And that's important because when we can do something like measure um, how quickly somebody can speak, the answer might be, well, that's great. They can speak quickly or slowly, but does that have an impact on their life? And tying that to a survey like this at least once can say, okay, this is a meaningful, impactful outcome measure in people's lives. So when we, when we line this up, we find that um, the participant rating of the CPIB does correlate with speed of speech. So you can see that people who have the lower score on the CPIB are those who have a slower speaking rate and articulation rate. Articulation is syllables per second, speaking rate is words per minute. But they're both conveying essentially the same thing, which is how quickly do people speak. Slower speech, more difficulty communicating. And here's another way to look at that. If we look at people who have a normal speaking rate of greater than 150 words per minute, they give the highest scores on the CPIB. It's the people who have slower speaking rates who are giving us scores that say communication is an issue. That's really, really impactful and meaningful for when we're measuring that kind of outcome measure. Now, we also use the GPS on the smartphone to look at how people are moving throughout their lives. Um, the data I'm gonna show now is really, it was really um, sort of, uh, we, we saw an opportunity to understand how COVID was affecting people with ALS. There was a small group of people who were using this, uh, this uh, smartphone platform uh, before and after the onset of the COVID pandemic. And we looked at how their behavior changed. So before the, the pandemic, people in this study were spending 19 and a half hours a day at home. After the pandemic, 23.7 hours a day at home. And you can see there's, there's really just almost one or two participants who are leaving their house at all. So really important to be able to quantify that. Also looking at, at published data, we can see that the average population was spending about 10 hours a day at home before the, the COVID pandemic. And in the few months after, we're spending about 14 hours a day at home. Sure, a big difference, just about the same difference, but not even reaching the amount of time at home that, that our, our cohort of people with ALS were spending at home before the pandemic. So when we talk about socially distancing, I think we're talking about really almost two different phenomena, same in kind, but, but different um, in amount. We also thought, you know, maybe there's a correlation between how quickly people speak and how much time they spend at home. And so we plotted that out. And in fact, and we'll have more data coming in, but in fact, we do see a very strong correlation here 
I think that there are lots of reasons for that, but it gives us a whole, uh, a whole sort of area to pick apart um, what's driving what, why are these correlated this way, and what more can we learn from that? Really, I think, critical data to understand the impact of this disease. When we started doing this, even the ALS FRSR results of somebody sort of putting their ALS FRSR into their phone was highly, highly uh, mistrusted by researchers. And so what we did in the cell phone study, and actually what I'm showing here is a slightly different study where we did this with people in the waiting room of our clinic, and then we, we redid the scale um, sort of in the traditional way with somebody administering it actually during the appointment. Um, but either way, what we found is that there is a very high correlation between a self-entry ALS FRSR and the, and the traditional kind of somebody delivers the ALS FRSR. However, they're not the same. Self-entry ALS FRSR is 2.3 points higher. That's true in this uh, cohort. In the smartphone cohort, it was almost exactly the same as 2.4. And we're generating more data all the time. It gives us a very good idea that we get reliable results from a self-entry. It may not be interchangeable with the ALS FRSR that's delivered in clinic, but it's telling us very much the same thing. There isn't a single question that's driving this either, or a single domain. It's sort of um, every question is just a little bit different. Now, I told you earlier that we have to think about adherence. That is, are people doing the tasks that we give to them? And we looked at, we're looking at this. This is unpublished data. We're looking at this. Um, and what we find is that adherence for active data is, as we might surmise, lower than passive data. So this is three different studies using the BWE platform. Some of them were shorter. One of them was a trial. One of them was a long observational study. And what we find is that um, by the time about 16 weeks has passed, something like that, 14 to 16 weeks, about half of people are still participating. If we look at biomarker studies, observational studies in the clinic, somewhere between 16 and 24 weeks is where we get to about 50% of people participating versus dropping out for almost all of our studies. So that's not unexpected. And the other thing is that we didn't do much to encourage people here. We just let them do the surveys on their own and didn't monitor it in real time at all. Having said that, when we did the same thing with passive data, you can see that more than half of the people were participating all the way up to 36 weeks. So really three times long, almost three times longer for passive data. And, and that is a real opportunity, I think. And in some of these trials, it, it really stayed way, way, way up at the top. So I think a really important thing to learn, we do have to be able to make sense out of the data. Um, it, it, and I think that's, that's sort of the, the trick is having good algorithms. Um, and that is something that we can crowdsource if we share data. We're following up our SMART study with the SMART plus wearable study, and we're doing this with MT Pharma Holdings of America support. We're gonna enroll 50 people with ALS and healthy controls, just a couple healthy controls. Um, we hope to expand by one site to double that number of people. The study looks very similar. We're doing a little more in-person. We're doing a few more surveys. It, notably, we've included the roads, which is uh, another survey that talks about disease progression, kind of like ALS FRSR. And then the big difference is that people are also given the option to wear either an anklet or a wristwatch that gets truly continuous accelerometer data. And we'll be able to compare, do we, do we benefit from that continuous data? Do, is it better to have a wearable on the arm or leg? How much information can we get from the smartphone? It would be great to not need to use a wearable, but at the same time, if we do need to use a wearable to get, to get incredibly detailed and rich information that's meaningful, we wanna know that now. So I think really, really hopeful about the outcome of this study. We're currently enrolling for that study. Um, one of the things I said early is that this is an open source platform. And that means the code for the BWE platform is all available to uh, people on GitHub. There are other researchers who have taken that and, and um, made the platform their own. I think open source is really important. BWE also allows us to get and share the raw data on a web-based platform. Behind the scenes, there's an analysis uh, platform in the Amazon web that will allow us to process data and we can share those process variables as well. So rather than raw GPS data, we can say, here's how much time people are spending at home. That may be useful to clinical researchers who don't, you know, aren't programmers. Um, there's a huge number of people who are working on this already across Harvard uh, School of Public Health, Institute of Health Professions, Mass General Hospital, Brigham and Women's. And I'm hoping to involve Ernest Frankel. We're sort of um, uh, halfway through the process of getting this data uh, to, to Ernest's lab, where he can integrate it with 
other studies and make more out of it even than, than we can as a single study. BWE also has provisions to replicate data collection. So exactly this, the parameters that we use to collect data can be replicated for a new study. And replication in science is incredibly important. And then um, the processing algorithms, once they're finalized, will be, will be open source so that um, people can see how we're getting the data that we are out of the raw data. And all of that transparency is incredibly important for the kind of science that we're doing. I wanna turn my attention now to um, another study that we're doing just briefly uh, with a company called NQ Medical. And NQ Medical has a way of looking at fine motor function, which is really interesting. They have a program that goes onto a cell phone and they have it for traditional keyboard as well, but we're using a cell phone platform. So on the mobile phone, um, there's a keyboard that replaces the standard keyboard. So it looks basically the same and it functions essentially the same. The only difference is it records how people strike keys and move their fingers between keys. So not what keys they're striking, but rather did they hit a key? Did they hit it in the middle? Um, how long did they hold it? How long did it take for their, for their thumb or their finger to move to the next key? And that can build over time because we get you know, millions of data points that can build um, what we call an NQ index. Um, and that NQ index is basically a picture of how people type. And then we can look at how that, how that distinguishes people who have a disease from those who don't have that disease. They've done this in Parkinson's. And here you can see the blue dots are people who are controls. The red dots are those with Parkinson's disease. And the algorithm can do a pretty good job, not perfect, but pretty good job of separating those who have Parkinson's disease and those who do not. Um, they're also investigating how that changes over time and are really are able to tell whether people with Parkinson's have taken their symptomatic uh, med medication or not. What we'd like to do in ALS is be able to see whether this NQI changes in a predictable way over time. And that might be an outcome measure both for clinical use and in clinical trials. So we designed a study. Um, the goal was, as I said, to sort of detect change over time and also assess the usability of the app. We wanted to enroll 30 healthy controls and 30 people with ALS and get detailed information about handedness, typing pattern on the phone, really important. It turns out there are about five or six ways that people tend to type, the two thumb kind, a one thumb kind, a hunt, hunter pecker kind. And there, there are a couple other ways that people hold the phone. Um, but we, once we record that, we can incorporate that into the NQI. And what we wanted to do is bring people in to have them do a sample of typing in clinic, get an ALS FRSR, vital capacity, do, do uh, strength testing of the small muscles of the hand. So we would have really detailed strength information and do that every three months and also get this continuous at-home mobile, mobile phone typing. Um, COVID happened, so we had to change our plans a little bit. We enrolled everybody remotely. We went to a telephone administration of the ALS FRSR. We have a little bit less detailed information about hand strength, but we're really gonna get very, very useful information out of this to tell us whether this platform does show us something. And the first window into this would suggest that we can distinguish between people with ALS and people who don't have ALS quite well. We'll see what we see over time. Um, so really kind of a, an interesting uh, approach to this. And there are, there are other, um, you know, there's sort of beginning to be a whole market for doing this kind of thing. Enrollment is complete. Uh, we have about six months until the end of this study, I think. Um, we're doing a digital ALS study with Biogen as well. Very simple design, very different approach at first. We were doing two in-person visits one week apart. And those in-person visits were really meant to digitize the neurological exam and um, give us insights into what we could get quantitative information about in the clinic. And we also had people doing an at-home app just to see about feasibility of that app. Um, the same thing happened to this study and we completely redesigned this one. It really became impractical to bring people in for what were two or three hour visits to do that digital neuro neurological exam. So we really relied more on, on the app and we put some of that digital neurological exam at home, um, including what's called a mouse point and click task, which is essentially using a, a computer mouse to follow a square and click on it um, on the computer screen. And then we have an, an iPhone app as well as an Apple watch that, that's used for uh, passive data collection. And we do a weekly ALS FRSR. We've still kept the option of having those two in-person visits. Uh, we'll see if we're able to do that before the end of the study. I think that would be great to have all this data and those two in-person visits, um, but 
uh, it's, it's still sort of an uphill battle with COVID. Just to give you a sense, first of all, participants for this study receive an iPhone and an Apple Watch. And that's because we really needed to standardize exactly the platform that we were, that we were using. And we're doing cognitive tasks, fine motor tasks, gross motor tasks. We have a walking task where people have a belt that we give them and they, they put the phone in a, a, a certain position on their, on their uh, phone. Pardon me, uh, they, they put the phone in the belt um, in a certain position on their body. Um, and then we have patient reported outcomes and even speech recording. So really a different approach. It may sound subtle, but it's actually a very different approach than what I've talked about already. Um, much more involved for people in the study. Maybe it gives us better, better data. Um, just to give you that mouse point and click task, uh, a, a little more insight into it. Um, down at the bottom, you see one of our researchers who's so, sort of demonstrating it, but you can see, maybe you can see that um, sort of red dot on the screen and he's moving his cursor over to click on it and then it'll show up somewhere else and he moves to click on that. And we found just in the small group of people who did this before COVID hit, that movement time, click duration, something called click slip, which is kind of the movement of the mouse when you click and the execution time for these tasks really does correlate with strength in the hand muscles um, in a way that is, that, is, that is quite remarkable. And also you can see that we can, um, we can distinguish between people with ALS and controls. So really, really quite exciting that we can use something as simple as a, a point and click task on a, on a computer to get information that, that makes this much of a distinction. So we're still enrolling for some of these studies and some of them may have generated questions. Um, we do have a research coordinator, Zoe Shire, who is in charge of this and is, is wonderful. Um, this is an email and a phone number. If you ever had questions, um, you know, you could certainly reach out to her or to me. I'd be happy to answer questions as well. And I want to end by talking about the Everything ALS uh, project, which is um, really expanding the biomarker horizons. And I'm not going to play the whole movie here on, on uh, from Everything ALS, but I just wanted to give a sense that, you know, what you've really seen in, in this presentation is a move from um, very rudimentary kind of, can we put an app on somebody's smartphone and collect digital data? Does that mean anything? How can we refine that? What are all the options that we have for collecting digital data? And now that everything ALS project and projects really are taking that to a whole new level. And I've been thrilled to be a part of this. Um, oh, maybe I'm, oh, yeah. Um, uh, I've been thrilled to be a part of this. And in large part, that's because at the center of all of this is open data. Because I think everything ALS is built around a community and that community does better if everybody has access to the data that's generated because who knows where the next brilliant idea is gonna come from. It may be that we're looking at the data all wrong and there are incredible insights to this. I'll give you an example of this. Um, uh, there's something called, this is a different field but there's something called functional MRI where we have people do a task and they're in an MRI machine. And when they do that task, it, it, a, a certain part of their brain lights up and we can tell that that's the part of their brain that, that's responsible for doing that task. So we have people snap their fingers and a part of their brain lights up and that's the part of the brain that makes you snap your fingers. Really pretty remarkable. And in the early days of doing this, there was all this background information. There, there was just a lot of kind of noise in the background and it would undulate and nobody knew what to do with it. So they got rid of it and they said, boy, it's noisy and we'd, we'd like to be able to get rid of that noise. And then a couple of researchers came along and said, you know, maybe that's not just noise. And they started to look at it differently. And in fact, that noise actually gave incredibly important information about how the different parts of the brain interacted with one another when people were at rest. Um, uh, and it's called the, the, the resting network of the brain. That resting network tells us what functional areas are connected to one another and it became a huge area of, of research and it turns out that in certain diseases there's a disconnection of the normal resting state network of the brain so looking at that same data through a slightly different lens opened a whole new way of understanding health and disease and that could certainly be the case here so um, not to be on a high horse about it but i think that's really really critical especially because everything ALS is collecting so much rich data, speech, video, connecting that to transcriptomics, looking at breathing, um, pulling cognition out of speech in a way that we haven't 
you'll hear about a really novel way of looking at web usage um, and, and even the possibility of an EMG sensor and then putting all this data together and, and um, being able to look at it from lots of different ways. The other thing is certain researchers will look at it one way, other researchers another way, and we all have a lens that we look at it through. So the other thing about everything ALS is that with this powerful community, we're enrolling people from across the country at a remarkable rate, a rate that is just unprecedented and, and incredibly uh, exciting for what we can accomplish. But also it means that people who might not have access to clinical trials, to clinical research, to all of the hope that it brings to be a part, being a part of moving that football forward on the field, um, now have access to that. And that in and of itself, that equity that it brings, that is a really powerful thing about, about the Everything ALS projects. Um, and so I think it's really important to, to acknowledge that as well. The other question that I get sometimes is, you know, um, are these studies overlapping? There are a number of studies that are enrolling at the same time. And I guess I would submit that if we're sharing data um, and if we're still in a time where we're figuring out what the best way to collect data is, that there is room for all of these studies to contribute and contribute meaningful things so that we can uh, move forward as a field. Um, and so I, I, I don't think anybody should ever feel um, bad about participating in one study and not another, um, or if they can participate in two, participating in two or three, um, but, but only participating in what, in what is sort of accessible to them and doable for them. All of those things are, are moving the field forward, especially if we've got this commitment to sharing data. Um, just to show, you know, just to show this slide that, that everything ALS has moved so quickly from speech to genomics to web browser usage that you'll talk about to breathing um, and, and combining all these things and uh, the Kaggle data competition, which is you know, just, just remarkable for bringing new minds into ALS. Um, I'm just, I'm thrilled to be a part of, of this as it, as it develops and, and what a community. So uh, we would put work into the studies that I presented here. Um, people from, as I said, MIT, MGH, uh, the Harvard School of Public Health, um, the Institute for Health Professions, within the NCRI, within the Biostatistics Center, multiple foundations and a number of industry partners. And it, it couldn't be done without that. So thank you for having me. Um, I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Ilad um, M. Tav is a senior principal researcher at Microsoft. And we are gonna unveil a, a research project with, um, with uh, Dr. Ilad um, heading this and really excited. And um, he is, um, also his latest book is called Crowdsourced Health and how what you can do on the internet will improve medicine. And I just wanted to also you know, bring up, we're doing all these things to improve uh, how we do our clinical trials in the end and how we can actually bring treatments to ALS. So it's all connected and we'll talk about it in our Q&A session. Thank you a lot. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me well? Yes. And also I want to acknowledge it's like 2 a.m. in Israel and he is awake today and doing <laughs> this at middle of the night for us. That's right. Yeah, it is pretty late. So uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, and as Indu said, I'm a principal researcher at Microsoft Research. And I've been interested in using the data that people leave online in order to study health. So I'll talk, uh, I'll give a few examples of, of our work. And then uh, I'll talk about the clinical trial that we're launching today. Yeah. So um, this slide has been doing the rounds a few months ago. Um, and what it shows is what happens during a 60 second period on average on the internet. And so perhaps around 200,000 people will tweet and 4.7 million videos will be viewed and so forth. And, and 4 million people will search in Google, which means that perhaps a million and a half or 2 million people will, will search in Bing. And in order to operate all these services, the data that people generate while they're doing um, whatever they do on these platforms is recorded somewhere. And that gives us something that's unprecedented. It gives us access to how people behave in a way that we couldn't do before. So, you know, just think about, say, a doctor's visit, which most people we know will visit a doctor usually around uh, twice a year. That's average across the population. People query on Google 
sometimes 10 or 20 or even more frequently than that every day. And so if you want to track how they're behaving on a very fine grained level, that's possible by looking at the data that people leave on these platforms. So we've been looking at ways of using these data, preserving anonymity and privacy, but in order to study health in a way that you couldn't really do in the past. And of course, we're not alone. There are multiple groups doing this. Um, I think over the years, we've learned that there are three areas that these kinds of data provide a benefit over traditional sorts of medical research. And um, this really chimes well with what James just talked about in his talk. So the first area is the obvious one. That's when people interact extensively with online content in order to understand something or learn about information or to interact with other people. Um, I'll give you an example of how we're using that in order to bridge the gap, the language gap between clinicians and patients in the case of uh, autism. The second area is when the data that comes off of uh, these kinds of internet platforms is more sensitive um, than what you get from uh, traditional medical data. And the best example is probably influenza, the flu, where most people will never see a doctor when they have the flu, but they will go online in order to tell their friends that they have the flu or in order to ask you know, whether chicken soup is good for treating the flu. Um, and so in those cases, we see about 20 times as many people as the medical system does. And today I'll show you an example of how we realized that this was also useful for uh, assisting in our response to COVID-19. And the last area is one where people have a difficulty reporting due to either what we call uh, reporting bias, which means um, it's something inconvenient or something that they would rather not talk about. For example, um, you know, if we want to, to understand say usage of recreational drugs, most people would not want to discuss this, but they do ask about it and they do share it uh, online in many of these platforms. The other is association bias. If you ask people about things that they really don't know how to help you with. For example, if I ask people who had a heart attack, what happened just prior to when you had a heart attack? So what uh, caused your heart attack? Well, most people will never have more than one, perhaps two heart attacks at most. So they cannot say, oh, whenever I go to you know, run a marathon, I get a heart attack. It doesn't work that way. But we can see many, many people who uh, report having a, undergone a heart attack and maybe we can make that association for them. And one area that we really see a benefit is in diagnosing serious illnesses. And I'll give you examples there as well. So let me really uh, very briefly touch on each one of these areas and uh, give you examples of our work. And as I said, the first one I'll talk about is when we bridge the language gap between parents and professionals in the case of autism. Um, here we looked, we started with a platform called Yahoo Answers. It's actually being shut down uh, in the next few weeks because Yahoo is undergoing going yet more turmoil. But uh, we noticed that there were um, tens of thousands of questions similar to the one that you can see here. So a parent is uh, uh, asking uh, other parents on this platform, how can I tell if my five-year-old baby has autism? And there's a brief description of why he or she thinks that their baby has autism. Obviously, at five weeks, it's very difficult to say that a child has autism. But this is something that's troubling this uh, parent. But let's look at a, a more um, perhaps worrying example. Here's another question uh, or part of a question. My child doesn't really play with other children so much as alongside with them. She talks very little. And most of uh, the talking she does is copying exactly what she hears and so forth. So here's a more worrying description by a parent who's worried that their child has autism. Now, the problem with these kinds of descriptions is that they don't contain the information that a clinician would want to look at. And actually, when we gave these descriptions to clinicians and asked them to um, assess whether this child has autism or not, it was extremely difficult for them to do. Um, simply because parents 
a lot of times don't know what the clinician would be looking for. So their description is what worries them. It's not what the clinician is looking for. So we said, well, maybe we can change this uh, a little bit and allow the uh, allow asking back a question. So instead of just having a description uh, description of a child, perhaps we can ask back and get the most pertinent information in order to diagnose. So how would this look like? Um, we have the, the parent's description of the child, and then we would have an algorithm that would say, wait a minute, how old is she? This is you know, extremely relevant information, and if we can get that information back, that would allow us to, to provide a better diagnosis. Or we could ask something that perhaps the parent had not thought of, does she play make-believe? And again, the answer to that question would be very useful. So uh, instead of just having the parent uh, provide a description, we'll ask back a few questions. Um, to do this, what we did was we ran a, a clinical trial where we recruited online uh, around 115 parents with children who they were worried had social or communication development issues. And what we did was we asked them to write a description of their child, simply sim similar to what you saw in Yahoo Answers. And then we gave them two screening questionnaires that a clinician would use in order to diagnose the child. So at the end of this uh, session, we would have the clinical diagnosis of the child, but also we could play that game of here's the description, what else would we want to ask a parent? And if we, uh, we decided on a question, we would have the answer. And then we trained an algorithm to look at the textual description decide if they needed to ask another question. We, we just uh, looked at one question. And then which question that would be, we gave the algorithm the answer, and then we asked the, the algorithm to give us a prediction for whether this child has autism or not. We knew the answer because we had the screening questionnaire. Um, so this is uh, one of the, the results, one of the main results. Here, the vertical axis is, is what we call the area under curve. This is a measure of accuracy of our model, of our algorithm. 0 0.5 basically means that we're flipping a coin in terms of our ability to predict whether this child has autism. One is a perfect decision. And so as you can see with text only, the computer is really just flipping a coin. It's not doing anything useful. But give the algorithm the ability to ask one question um, to add to the information that the parent provided and we can get to 0.91, which is almost a perfect decision. So the algorithm is doing almost as good as a clinician in, in terms of diagnosing the child. And it's interesting to look at what kinds of questions the algorithm could ask and did ask. So here are um, some of the questions of this diagnostic questionnaire. And here you can see the ones that the algorithm chose most often to ask uh, of the, the parent. And so, for example, the most frequently asked question was, if you point at something in the room, does your child look at it? And I'm a parent of three boys, and I would not have known that this was uh, such an important diagnostic question for autism. So it's interesting to see that indeed the algorithm learned to ask the questions that parents did not think of talking about when they wrote their textual description. Let me move on to the, my next example. And this is where, as I said, the, um, the data from the internet is really a more sensitive indicator than what you would get from uh, medical or sort of traditional medical information. Very early in the pandemic, we noticed something interesting about people asking about symptoms of COVID. This, these are people who were asking on Bing, um, in this case in England, about uh, specific symptoms of um, COVID. Here, the blue line shows you uh, over time, the number of people who asked about cough uh, on being in a specific county in England. And in the brown line, these are the number of new COVID-19 cases that were identified every day in this county. And what you can see is that there is a, these curves look very, very similar to each other, but the number of diagnosed cases lags by about 10 days. So people ask about dry cough about 10 days 
before they are diagnosed with COVID-19. And we've seen this around, across the world. We've seen this in England, but also in Israel, in, in uh, Western Europe, and in, even in Africa, in some cases where we had data. People um, contact uh, COVID-19, they start asking about the symptoms, and then it takes around uh, between a week and, and two weeks, depending on the country, until they are formally diagnosed with COVID-19. And that's one of the reasons that it's so difficult to, hand, to tackle this pandemic, because in those two weeks or in those 10 days, they will continue infecting other people until they are formally identified as uh, patients. But this also gives us an opportunity because we can use those data in order to inform authorities that um, they can expect, say, an outbreak of COVID because we see many people asking about uh, symptoms ahead of time. And that's something that we do in Israel, uh, in, in, in England, sorry, but uh, let me show you uh, what I think is a nicer example of what we did in Israel. So um, quite early again in the pandemic, Microsoft put out uh, a product called the Microsoft Healthcare Bot. And this allows people to go onto a website and uh, it will ask them about their symptoms, about their demographics, age and gender, and about uh, underlying illnesses. And after a pretty short interaction, it will tell them one of several options, either that they can stay at home because it's uh, what they're experiencing is not uh, critical at this point, call a family physician or go to the emergency room. So this was, um, as you can see, this was quite widely used, including in Israel, but we added another layer to this. And what we did was when people asked about the symptoms of COVID, this would be um, just generally asking what are the symptoms of COVID-19, or it could be uh, somebody mentioning specific symptoms such as dry cough or fever and so, so forth. We showed an ad saying, there's this uh, Microsoft healthcare bot would you like to try it and get a sense for whether your illness is, is serious or not? People who chose to click on the ad were referred to the bot. Here you can see the bot from the uh, CDC instance. And um, they could interact with this bot. And at the end, as I said, they got one of several uh, responses. Here's the uh, urgent response. So urgent medical attention may be needed. Please call 911 or it could be something um, much less worrying or perhaps even uh, uh, helping uh, to, to realize that you're fine. Sounds like you or they are feeling okay. Um, what we also did was when somebody received this uh, urgent medical attention response, we told the advertising system, these are the people that we're interested in. Get us more people like that. And because advertising systems um, have a, access to a lot of information about us, they can tune themselves to focus on specific people. And very quickly, the advertising system, in this case, we used uh, Google actually, um, learned to focus on the people that were most in need. And over six months that we ran this uh, trial, about a quarter of a million people uh, saw our ads out of a population of around 9 million. So perhaps one in 20 people saw our ads in Israel. Um, almost 12,000 people chose to click on the ads and 722 people received the urgent uh, medical attention response. So there were over 700 people that really needed to get to an emergency room now um, who did not do that and instead went online and asked about their symptoms. And we helped them realize that actually you should really go to the emergency room. The other thing that happened here is in, in the background, the advertising system tells us um, an aggregate count about what uh, people were asking. And so we could look at, for example, whether at a city level, uh, how many people received the urgent uh, response versus all the people who clicked on the ads. And when we did that, we found that there was a really strong correlation about around nine days between, uh, with a lag of around nine days between when people were receiving this urgent response and when, uh, and the number of hospitalizations from those cities. So we could give 
uh, an alert of uh, nine, er, nine days earlier than what the health ministry in Israel knew about where people were becoming sick with COVID-19. Okay, and moving to my last example, um, as I said, a lot of times um, people just don't realize what their symptoms are, and therefore we can use that to screen for uh, quite serious medical conditions. Um, right now, we have a list of conditions that we think we can identify um, using, um, broadly speaking, internet data, but mostly uh, the data that comes off of the interactions that people have with a search engine, specifically uh, being in Google. So these uh, include things like dementia, Parkinson's disease, depression, eating disorders, but also, uh, so these are all uh, mental health conditions, but also physical health conditions, such as uh, several forms of cancer, diabetes in, in some of the people who experience uh, symptoms. And I put here in parenthesis uh, conditions that we think we can identify, but we haven't published them in the literature yet. So uh, I've, I've marked them uh, as different. Uh, stroke, for example, is a really interesting one. We think that we can identify uh, stroke around two months before it occurs. If that's true, that would be dramatic. But uh, you may ask, why can we do that? Why can we identify that somebody has, say, breast cancer by looking at the things that they ask online? And I think there are three main reasons for that. One is many people don't know the relation between the symptoms that they're experiencing and specific diseases. For example, when you go and ask uh, lay people, you know, not medical people, what is one probable cause of uh, constant thirst? Most people don't know that this may be a sign of diabetes. And so they will go online and ask, you know, why am I feeling thirsty constantly? And that with other such uh, queries may help us to realize that they have diabetes. Other times, uh, it's the association between symptoms that's worrying, not each uh, symptom individually. And a case in point is ovarian cancer, uh, where each one of the symptoms in and of itself may not be worrying. It's the confluence of symptoms that is worrying. And for that reason, a lot of times women will get to a physician quite late, and it's quite difficult to treat because when, and even when they get to the physician, they will often complain about the last symptom that they experience, not, uh, not realize that actually they should really report all of them. And finally, it's just human to defer treatment, right? Yes, I'm not feeling well and I have these symptoms, but I'll visit the physician next week. Let me just ask about it online. And that really helps us um, do this kind of screening, this kind of um, uh, identifying that a person has a medical condition before they realize that they have it. Um, let me give you a, an example from diabetes. So if we look at people who at some point uh, in their queries indicate that they have diabetes, so they might query for something like, I've been diagnosed with diabetes, what can I eat? If we mark those queries as having been made on day zero, and then we go back in time and look at the queries that they made before, we find that they start asking about weight loss more than three months before they, they uh, are diagnosed. They start asking about blurred vision around two weeks before they're, they're diagnosed and so forth. Um, there are other, conditions, other symptoms as well. And that uh, is what allows us to predict that those people will eventually be diagnosed with uh, diabetes um, just looking at the queries that they make. Of course, we don't know who these people are. They're all anonymous to us. Uh, but we can provide that uh, prediction. What do we do with it? Well, one thing that we won't do is what I've created in this mock-up here. This is uh, something that I created. Um, you know, so think about somebody asking, do I have lung cancer? We won't pop a message saying, call your doctor immediately. That's not ethical and that's um, almost impossible to do technically. But we do have ways of using this information to help people. And um, we, I won't go into the details today, but we have several ways that we think we can use these kinds of uh, predictions to empower people to decide if they want to get this information. And uh, if they do, how to provide it in the way that helps them 
and doesn't uh, unnecessarily scare people into thinking that they have something that they may really not have. And with that, I'll move to our clinical trial, um, which will try to screen for ALS by looking at search engine queries. And what we did as preliminary work was we looked at uh, um, anonymous people who asked at some point on Bing uh, and indicated that they have ALS. Uh, so these would be queries such as, I've been diagnosed with ALS or my doctor told me I have ALS. And we compared them to other people who made similar common queries. Why common queries? Because um, similar people will use um, often similar common queries, but less uh, of the rare queries. And so we tried to see whether we could separate people who indicated they have ALS from everybody else by using attributes such as, did Bing use a spelling correction um, algorithm? How common are the queries that people use? And how long were the search sessions that people were, were making? We didn't actually look at the text of the queries because we wanted to preserve people's uh, privacy, but we looked at these technical parameters of the queries to try and separate the two. And it turns out that it, it is possible. We can identify who are the, who are the people who have ALS from the entire uh, group. Let me show you an, um, why. So on the left here, you can see the percentage of people um, the percentage of uh, people who had the autocorrect module triggered. Um, and in the dotted line, these are the controls. The, the bold line is uh, people who indicated that they have ALS. And you can see that there is uh, more um, spelling corrections or spelling, the autocorrect was triggered in the people who have ALS. Um, on the right hand side, these are the percentage of rare queries. So these are the uncommon queries that people use. And here, people in the ALS group, you had many more of them compared to the general population. So these kinds of indicators allowed us to differentiate between the two groups. But this is all done with people who queried for um, and indicated that they have ALS. We don't really know that they have it. And um, it may be that they're asking for somebody else it may be that we're, we're not identifying the right people. And so what we're going to do now is um, to try and get, uh, recruit people who, uh, indicate, who know that they have ALS because they have been clinically diagnosed. And um, because we want to be very careful about uh, privacy and anonymity, we're going to recruit them anonymously. Uh, we'll collect the data, um, um, about their illness, but also we will go back and try and find their data on Bing and correlate between the two and test our model to see whether we could have identified that they have ALS by looking at the, these technical parameters of their queries, and also whether this, these data change over the course of the disease. Can we look at people's queries and make some uh, indication of how long they've been diagnosed. Um, if you want to participate, we would be very thankful. Uh, you'd need to go to this link, aka.ms uh, forward slash ALS study. We'll ask you to uh, consent to the study, obviously. And then we'll ask you uh, very few questions such as, have you been diagnosed? When were you diagnosed? Uh, your age and your gender. And then uh, we'll ask you to click on a link and that will allow us to uh, find your Bing queries and link them to your questionnaire response. As I said, we won't know who you are, but that uh, click will allow us to make the link between queries and your responses to our questions. Um, we won't look at the text of your queries. That's not something that's, um, that we want to look into, as I mentioned, because of privacy. But we will look at the parameters, such as whether the speller was used, how long did it take before somebody clicked on a link, and so forth. Um, we won't have, or we won't ask, and we won't have any identifying attributes. Um, and that's uh, also the reason that we won't be able to 
give you back any personal information, but uh, obviously after we complete analyzing the data, we will publish the findings and let you know whether we were able to validate this model. If we are able to validate it, we'll have a new tool in the doctor's toolbox to help people, first of all, um, diagnose ALS, but also to uh, look at the progression of the disease over time. And so much, um, Dr. James Berry and Dr. Yomto for your presentations. We hope we really showed um, to our audience with your great presentations, how important digital bi biomarkers are um, in accelerating um, participation, um, gathering data, and hopefully speeding up the, the clinical trial process and treatments. Um, we really quickly, we wanna jump into Q&A, but we do have one of our, um, one of the people in our ALS community here, his name is Dave Warnick. And Dave, um, he's participating in our Everything ALS speech study. And we just wanted to give him to, a chance to talk just one minute, two minutes, just share your experience of um, what you think of our study and what your experience has been. Are you, are you still with us, Dave? I'm here. Oh, awesome. Great. Can you hear me? <laughs> patika, 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 patika. <laughs> so if you don't know what that means, you haven't done the speech study, right? <laughs> Plus, I've learned a lot more about bamboo than I ever thought I needed to know. <laughs> so we've, um, Devin and I both have, have signed up for the speech study. We've done it three or four times now. It's so easy. It only takes 10 or 15 minutes. And so um, I made a, uh, a video and, and put it out on my uh, social media platforms uh, just, what, just a few days ago. And... Um, I've gotten about a dozen people that have sent me messages and said they signed up for the speech study. Awesome. So I just want to encourage everyone, not only sign up, but get out to the people that you're in your network, uh, make a little video. I did about a 30 second video and sent it out and um, just get it to the people that you know and, and tell them uh, how simple it is. And people evidently, when they sent me messages said, I signed up, it's really simple, really easy. Um, there wasn't a lot of, I didn't get a lot of response saying, hey, I tried to and I couldn't, or it was too complicated, or I got none of that. Everyone said, yep, signed up, glad to help, that kind of thing. So there's people out there that will be, um, just because you're connected with them, they'll be thrilled to help. And that's, that's the response I got. I'll probably do another video in another week or so, and I'm kind of tagging it to the um, uh, May being the ALS Awareness Month, and so, you know, kind of uh, tagging along to that, but I'll probably send another one out in a week or so and just kind of make another run at it, but it's, um, yeah, I was very pleased about 12 people responded immediately and said, I, I did it, so they're out there, we just got to find them. Well, there's nothing like hearing it straight from, you know, the mouth of somebody who's doing it and talking about how easy it is because, um, you know, we want to share people's experience. So we appreciate you sharing it with us. And I just um, wanted to add something. Oh, yeah. Well, um, we actually were talking with Indu, I guess, a couple of days ago, and their goal is to have this enrolled by August. But we're talking 1, about needing um, about 500 more people, give or take, because sometimes not everybody qualifies. And I personally think that could be done by the end of April. I mean, the end of May. End of April would be a trip. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still in April, guys. Anyway, <laughs> um, because this is every this is ALS Awareness Month. I mean, this is the time when we all should be posting about this on our social media platforms. And the biggest thing people get is, you know, well, what can I do? This is like a fatal disease. It's just depressing. And instead of just depressing people more, I say there is something you can do. There is a way to contribute. And um, most everybody here online tonight is directly connected with ALS. Either they're um, a pals or they're a cows or they're a friend or know people really connected. And so that's sort of a slam dot. Um, but I have friends that just, they don't even really know Dave, but they know me. And, you know, I'm just going to flat out say, it. this is what I really need. You know, all those fundraisers you want me to donate to, I'm not asking for money, just asking for a little bit of your time. So, um, I mean, I'm looking here, we got what, 88 people in the chat, five, all of y'all pick, picked up five people, got five people to sign up. 
It'd be done. It'd be done before the end and, of the month. And we're in a couple of other groups um, online, Facebook groups and otherwise. Bevan's going to send messages out, encouraging all of them if they haven't to, uh, to jump on board and, and, and sign up for the seed study. So yeah, let's I mean, get her done. Well, okay. we we Thank appreciate you guys. It. And I just wanted to add, uh, like Bevan was saying, you know, not everybody has to have ALS or PLS. Mm -hmm. or even, yeah, exactly. So Bevan, you know, she, she was thinking she's going to go to school <laughs> and try to recruit a lot of people from speech therapy school. So, you know, we're looking for people with, um, you know, don't have ALS and also family members and pretty much anybody who can, you know, who's over 18 can participate. And where else do you get to say put the ka put the ka put the ka put the <laughs> Nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> we have a competition going on. <laughs> All right. Awesome. And Thank you, Dave. Thank you, David. Yeah. Um, my name is Sarah. Uh, and we are going to transition to this uh, question and section of our presentation so that um, Dr. Aladd can probably go to bed here soon because it's so late his time, but we appreciate them both being here. So uh, we'll get started. Um, this is for both of you for both studies. Uh, for people further advanced, uh, are they able to participate in these digital biomarker studies as well? And is these studies eye gaze or voice control um, capable? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. Um, and I saw that come into the chat. We, we um, it, it depends a little bit on which study um, uh, I, I'm, our apps are basically not honed for eye gaze control. We have talked about, about creating one that would be for eye gaze control. Um, and I think we, what we need to do is really think carefully about what we want to monitor there. And it's actually, I think, uh, um, the, the planning for that is really important, but I think we're, we're getting rid of a lot of information that's coming in and all we need to do is capture it and we can, and we can I think, find things that are really important. So. I think that's a really, really great suggestion and one that is actionable. Um, and we just need to think a little bit about what, what data we want to capture and, and what, um, you know, what question we want, to, we want to answer. And for our study, I think it definitely, it is possible to participate because what we will do is we'll go back in time and find those queries that you made perhaps a year ago um, and use those queries as well as the more recent data. So yes, definitely go and participate if you can. I love that. I love that question. I, I love it. Hi, my name is James. I'm going to be uh, also asking questions on behalf of everyone as well. Uh, specifically, this one's for Dr. Elad. Um, the Microsoft study, we talked about its capability with eye gaze technology. Uh, is text to talk technology also involved as well for those who may not have the um, ability to type their searches in physically? Again, the, the answer is yes, because even if you can't type them today, if you could type them a year ago, we can still go back and find them. And that's really the, the point of our study is trying to uh, go back in time, if you will, and looking at how uh, people were, were interacting with the search engine back then in order to say, well, could we have said anything useful back then? And I'd just amplify that and say, um, you know, there are probably trend, you know, it may be that we can find uh, data that would be, that would tell us about when people make transitions in their care, not just sort of diagnostically. And that is a transition would be really interesting to look for. Yeah, that's a really interesting thought too. It even expands those study, those study parameters out even more. Um, speaking of a study, this is about the SMART study that you talked about, Dr. Barry, in your presentation. Uh, a question was asked, what is the average age of the participants? Um, for those people who may be you know, a little slower to text because they didn't grow up as children of the technology era, um, prior to their symptoms, will that change the development of the study or how the results are? So, so um, re really, really good question. So um, the average age in, in the SMART study, at least in, in the, the first half of it or so, was around 55. Um, when we were looking at the NQ study, where this is probably going to have the biggest impact, um, because we're looking at, at typing, we actually restricted our healthy controls 
to over 40 because we wanted to get essentially age matched because that probably does matter. With a bigger population, we would actually be able to ask that question by enrolling broadly. With a smaller population of pilot study, we wanna control for that so that we get basically comparable groups. Um, but um, I think the average age in the NQ study, I don't have it right in front of me, but I think the average age is between 50 and uh, 55 and 60 as well. Uh, Dr. Berry, to follow up for those of us who may be not as uh, familiar with biomarkers, um, could you explain how, uh, did Dr. Berry, to follow up for those of us who may be not as uh, familiar with biomarkers, um, could you explain how uh, the digital biomarkers may change the diagnostic process for those with ALS? Yeah, absolutely. This is a, this is a great question and, and fundamental and, and in some ways shame. Everyone looks at this through a different lens. Sometimes we're doing a study um, like any of these just to learn about a disease. And that's part of what we want to do. What is the impact of the disease? And can we quantify it? And can that teach us about what's important about the disease? So let me give you an example. Um, in clinic, people tell me all the time that their speech is more, more difficult at night. Sometimes people say it's actually more difficult in the morning. It gets easier. But many times they say when I'm tired or in the nighttime, it's, it's harder. But when we quantify, when we ask our questions for, for clinical studies and when we quantify anything for clinical studies, we do that during the day. In fact, I looked at when, when we did our studies across a broad section of studies and almost all of them were between 10 in the morning and three in the afternoon. A very, very small sort of window of time where most of our data comes from. But when we open this more broadly and people have their cell phone at home or they have their web interface at home, like in the Everything ALS, we can actually ask the question, what happens across time? It's a whole new way to understand the disease. So that's an understanding piece. Another lens to view this through is, what is the impact of this on clinical trials? How does this get us to a treatment faster? And that, that answer uh, goes like this. In order for us to test a treatment, we have to test an outcome. So we need to give it a new therapy and then we need to follow some, how something changes. And oftentimes that's the ALS functional rating scale. The more noise there is in that thing that we follow and the slower it is to change, the longer the study we have to do and the more people we have to enroll. So if we have a, if we have a marker that changes very rapidly, that has very little variability or that can give us so much data that we can overcome that variability by having lots of data, then we can do shorter trials they can be easier for people to participate in, which means we enroll them faster. And our timeline for testing drugs gets shorter and shorter and shorter, and we can get to answers faster. That was wonderful. <laughs> That's exactly what we want to hear and why Everything ALS is working so hard to do this, along with yourself and Dr. Lab. Um, this next question goes to him. Uh, do participants in the Detect ALS study have to have used Bing prior? Is there any capability to have if using other search engines um, for this study? Um, unfortunately, we do need them to have used Bing. Um, the reason is, is uh, if you use Google, only Google will have access to your data. Um, that said, I think in many cases, people may not realize that they've used Bing. And so even if you think you haven't used it, I would appreciate it if you participate. And worst case, we won't find your queries, but um, hopefully you will. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, back to Dr. Berry about the uh, biomarkers. Is there any initial impressions on where the FDA stands on digital biomarkers? And are any of these being used in early clinical trials that are current? Yeah, so, so really good question because ultimately to incorporate things into trials, we need FDA buy-in. There is very clear evidence that the FDA wants digital biomarkers to be a part of trials. And I've been at a number of meetings where we've talked about this, where FDA has given presentations about how to do this. Um, it gets a little more complicated when we actually come down to sort of, you know, how do we get regulatory buy-in? So, I, you know, in, in all honesty, um, I think there's still some distance to travel, but we need the data that we're generating now to go to the FDA. Um, and then I think I think shared decisions get made when there's data to look at. Um, and you know, it's sort of a unilateral decision when it when it becomes sort of well, imagine this scenario, imagine that scenario. And I will say, I just I think this is really important. My experience is that it's very hard for people to imagine these things. You know, I spent a long time trying to trying to sort of pitch the idea that we should look at digital biomarkers or at search data. 
And without some data, people just don't necessarily get it. Once we have data, then we can look at the data together and we can make decisions about how, how to enact it. So this is the first step in, in doing that. FDA is very engaged in conversations with, with many people, many companies and, and researchers who make apps and wearables. And so, um, yes, they are being, they are being used. Um, in a number of trials, we're using home spirometry. Um, in a number of trials, including the Healy ALS platform trial, we're using uh, speech recordings. Um, and some of those are generated at home. Sometimes they're generated in the clinic. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're, and we've actually put them into trials in the past as well. So um, it's here. That's great. Um, for our study with you, Dr. Alad, uh, for the DETECT ALS study, can asymptomatic carriers participate? Also family members who may be um, children or um, loved ones of ALS patients who may also be a carrier in the future? Yes, we are. Um, we, we do ask uh, the questions that will allow us to differentiate between the two. And so, yes, uh, those data will be very useful to us. Um, next question is actually for both of you. Um, starting with Dr. Barry, for your study, um, we know you're enrolling the wearable, wearable devices. Can a person's current wearable devices, like their current smartwatch, be used for the study? And for the uh, browser study as well, is it only limited to just a person's physical computer or are smartphone apps capable of search engine queries also involved as well? That's great. Let me, I'll go first and then, and then Elad can answer the, the search engine. So right now, we are not um, incorporating existing wearable data, but that is an active conversation that we're having in our digital team. Um, um, because I, I think I think it could be really powerful to do that, and and so um, we have to sort of organize with how how we would do that, and and um, and how we would make that data most useful. Um, the, when you get into the nitty gritty of it, and again, you know, I work with people who do, who do all of this, the, the sort of the algorithms that are used to calculate step count, for example, differ by device. And so we'd have to do a little bit of digging and, and sort of collating by device. It turns out they don't just differ by device, they differ by time in the device. So, so for example, Apple updates its algorithms for giving you step count. So you have to know when the data was collected, but that's all that's all doable once you, once you open your mind to the possibility. So, I'm, I'm hopeful that this will be a rich source of data. Um, it's not quite here yet. Yeah, and to the question of whether it's possible to use not just desktop, but also mobile or tablets, it is possible. So um, we, we do, this information does exist. So if you typically use a tablet, say we'll know that this is your interaction with a tablet and therefore this will be factored into the uh, data. Excellent. More and more data we get, the better. <laughs> uh, on that note, is it possible to be in multiple digital biomarker trials at the same time? I know we have a lot of people on this call on the speech study, so could they be in these other uh, studies as well? Yeah, they absolutely can. Um, you know, we don't want to overload people. Um, and and um, I know the question came in, you know, uh, um, um, or the comment came in that, you know, people only have so much energy um, and so don't want to duplicate tasks, which, I, you know, I absolutely understand. Um, sometimes, you know, you, you, so if you're in the Everything ALS Speech Study, which is a fabulous study, which is using some of the most cutting edge technology to use uh, video and speech together and will just, and, and then share that, it will allow us a hugely powerful data set. Um, that, is, that is wonderful. Um, it may be that you don't want to participate in another study that's really focused on speech. And so we look for a, for a digital biomarker study that allows you to use a wearable and, you know, doesn't focus as much on speech because that just feels tiresome. And, um, you know, we're sharing that data across studies. Anyway, we're not perfect on this. And I, you know, I would apologize that we're not perfect. So it would, what the ideal thing would be to be sort of very much modular. So if you're in a speech study somewhere else, we take out the, the speech on the study that you're doing. We're, we're moving to that. We're thinking about how we make all that fit. We're not perfectly there yet. And I, I apologize for, for that, but, um, but I think we can move in that direction very quite easily. 
Um, a a two parter first for Dr. Barry, uh, with your trial specifically, would asking people to type something they see on screen work as well as monitoring what they compose from their own thoughts? And uh, for both of you, I know there with technology, there are always privacy concerns. What steps are in place to protect the individual data for each user involved in your trials? Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. Actually, part of the NQ study um, is that uh, at the beginning and at a couple of time points, people do type something that is on the screen so that we have a very constrained task very much what we would call active data collection. Um, the rest of the time we're collecting keystroke data from just, just you know, usage every day. Um, that privacy concern is mitigated by the fact that the app cannot collect what is typed, only, only the metadata about how it's typed. And that's vetted through the Institutional Review Board or the IRB, which is known as the, as the Ethics Board. Um, that is actually, that has been shared with the FDA in, a, in sort of a, a you know, working with the FDA digital um, group um, to try to sort of come to some um, uh, agreement about, you know, how this would be used in clinical trials. So FDA has weighed in on that as well. But it's really the IRB um, and uh, and sort of the tech pieces of the IRB that, that look at privacy. So it's vetted that way. And, and just to add, um... Our trial is also approved by an IRB, and they were very specific about the kinds of information that we look at. And as I said, we won't look at the text of queries, but that because that could be quite personal, we only look at the metadata. Um, I see a question about whether we collect IP addresses. We don't have access to IP addresses. That con that's considered personal identifying information as well. Um, and the entire design of the trial is very much centered around the idea of anonymity. So we really won't look at who you are. We only want to know to link the information about the ALS to the parameters of the queries. That's really important to know. And I think it helps kind of alleviate any concerns. So I appreciate you both uh, being willing to answer that for us. Um, this goes to Dr. Barry for the NQ study. Um, were the participants divided by bull bar versus uh, limb onset? And were there any results that noticed a difference in the two groups in any particular specific measurement marker? Yeah, so we, we do record that information and we are going to stratify on it. Um, what, we've, what, what we've seen so far is really just a very first pass sort of interim analysis. Um, the way that that study works is that they, so they use basically the Parkinson's algorithm to show an interim analysis at, at baseline of, of, of actually it was the constrained typing test. So people typing what they read um, and a little bit of the free, of the free typing. Um, but the way that that study will work is that we'll use it to really build the algorithm um, on about half of the subjects and then, and then test on the rest. So I think we won't know until the end how all this kind of comes together. My, my, my hope would be that we could tell a difference between people who had limb symptoms and did not have limb symptoms at the time of the study. Um, and, and even more interesting will be to look at the people who don't appear to have limb symptoms and see if we can distinguish someone who has ALS but maybe not hand weakness from somebody who doesn't have ALS, which is a high bar but may not be impossible. Um, the, uh, forgive me if I mispronounce this, for the BWE platform trial, I know, I believe you discussed saying that each participant is uh, given an, their own iPhone to kind of um, baseline the, the data collection. Is there any plans in the future to expand that to other devices such as Android phones um, once you move on from the initial study? Yeah, so really important to, to distinguish. So the BWE study, the smart study that I talked about that's on the BWE platform, that actually goes onto your own, your own cell phone and, and people use it on their own cell phone. It, it's mostly in the background. The truth is that the app has almost nothing in it. It just gives you a reminder to do a task now and again, but otherwise is, it lives very, very small. Um, the, another study that I talked about, which is being done in, in conjunction with Biogen, is taking a quite a different approach. And that is um, a number more sophisticated tasks to try to get at cognition, fine finger movement, it's a little more active. 
Um, and for that study, it is all done on an iPhone. And so we provide the iPhone to people, um, which you know, is nice, but it's really useful for the study. And if you have a different phone, you know, it, it, it presents a little bit of a challenge. We are, you know, we've talked about um, how we might uh, open that to uh, what we call in the, the sort of term of art for it is bring your own device. Um, and so uh, we, we've talked about how that might, might be expanded to bring your own device. That presents some challenges because screens are different sizes, um, operating systems are different. Uh, you know, so there's a, there's a whole other set of things that you have to control for, but it certainly is easier. Uh, this will be our last question. So we do appreciate your guys' time. Um, is there any way ALS patients can monitor these digital biomarkers themselves at home? Is it something that would be useful for them to be monitoring and maybe even provide to their physicians at clinic? It's an interesting question. I, I would say that over the years, so first of all, I, I want to just take a step back and say, I can't remember the last time I saw a person who came to me for the diagnostic, the first visit, and hadn't been searching on the web for their symptoms. And so, you know, I think um, this, the, the sort of the, the, the web, the search engine study, I think is incredibly powerful for that reason, because, um, you know, We've tried to use things like natural language processing to look at medical records to say, you know, maybe we could diagnose it earlier. But if you if you think about what has to happen in that study, a physician or a nurse practitioner would have to meet with a patient, take down their symptoms, write it down, not recognize that ALS is a possible cause of that, do that multiple times. And then when you go back and use natural language processing, you can somehow pick out the symptoms. I think more often um, they're unfolding slowly, it's not recognized or not written down. But at the same time, people are at home really asking these questions to their search engine. And I think that's where we, you know, that's where there's real possibility. Um, in the same way, a lot of the data that we're talking about here is already collected on people's phones. And so I have had more and more people coming to me and saying, here's my Fitbit data, here's my phone data. And sometimes it's really quite compelling, I, I have to say. Um, you know. Here's how I used to walk. Here's how I'm walking now. It's really pretty different. Um, and I think it is meaningful. And I think that's what we'll find. How, you know, how do we incorporate that into clinical care? Um, you know, that's, that's a fluid thing. Um, but I, I think absolutely it's worth looking at and, and talking about. And I think Apple thinks that and Google thinks that. And that's why they've created things like HealthKit and allowed you to track steps. They think that there's useful information in there. And I tend to agree with them. Um, so yeah, that's something you can look at. I would, but we don't know for sure, you know, and I think that's a, that's a caveat we have to say is, you know, we, that's why we need to do these tests. And then we need standardized ways to put that into clinical trials. Well, on that note, I want to thank you both so much for coming and joining us today. We've learned a lot and it looks like there's a lot to look forward to in the future. And I think that that's one of the, the big things that we want to reiterate is just as much as everybody participating in the speech study or the detect ALS study, all these things are so, yes, they're important now and they're so important now, but they're really important tomorrow. And we're really hoping to see some of that come out and come to fruition here soon and very shortly. So um, I wanna thank you both again. And um, we now move to our uh, open forum section where everyone gets to be unmuted and kind of hear what they have to say. So um, I wanna first and foremost, once again, thank you both. And uh, we will be looking forward to everything that is to come from this in the future. And really quickly, before we move on, I have two thoughts. Number one is um, search engines hold a lot of secrets. And my second thought is, um, I, you know, if everybody, well, actually, it's not, it's not a thought. It's an ask. If everybody here could just get one, two, three, four, five, even five people signed up for our speech study, it would be so helpful. I mean, we've been going at lightning speed, but just you know, we want to keep our momentum and the more people we can get on board, the more data we're going to have. So if, you know, again, it's compatible with um, most internet devices, smartphones, laptops, um, tablets. So refer your friends, healthy or diagnosed with ALS or PLS, 18 and over, living in the U.S. You could be in, you could be taking any medications, you can be involved in other trials and still do this. So we don't have a lot of exclusions and do it from the you know privacy of your 
own home. Super easy. So if you guys could ask your friends, your coworkers, your groups, your communities, um, and help get people on board, we'd really appreciate it. So that's all. Thanks. Hit subscribe now so you can receive all the up-to-date videos.